I remember that in the corner, you know, there in the farther corner, halfway in between, standing in the, the not corner, but in the room to the right of me, this light started to appear. And it was so brilliant. It was, and it started from this little tiny spot and just grew. And it was so bright. And it, as it got brighter, I looked and the shadow just quickly went back and went away. So you saw as a light started to manifest, the shadow that was crawling along the wall zipped back. Zipped back. Okay. Zipped back. It's a rigid point and left. And gone. Yeah. Was was not even hiding in the corner. Like it was gone. How that and so I, I told my mom about him. I was so excited when I saw him. I told her about him. And it was one of those, yeah, 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 yeah. And... Um, very cute okay and I remember being very frustrated because she would just talk to him about you know she would say he was an invisible friend you know oh what a cute invisible friend Linda's got an invisible friend you know and it's like no I know what those are he's different like I didn't know what he was but I knew that's not what he was I didn't have a word for him and I wouldn't be very insistent and that was about the time I was supposed to go to school and I remember my mom telling me, you've got to stop talking about this stuff. Or people are going to think you're weird. You know, don't talk about him. Don't talk about this stuff. Don't talk about that. You know, people will think you're weird. So stop it because you're going to school. And I was furious. You know, and I went and I complained to him. You know, how mom didn't understand. And I was so heartbroken when he said, no, actually she does. And you have to stop talking about me. And as I lean back, pretending to be calm, I feel this round, cold thing at the nape of my neck. And I freeze. And my thought is, what's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? And about the third, what's that? I realize it's the barrel of a gun. And instantaneously, I hear a bang. And what happens then is this heat, this redness, just absolute, all I see is red, redness and heat shoots to my head and down to my feet. And then just as quickly, blackness and coldness comes back up. And then nothingness. And then nothingness. And that is my dream that I had every single night. It never varied. It never changed. Welcome back everyone to Third Eye Salon. I am with the wise, luscious, and wonderful goddess, Ms. Linda coulter -Burge. Thank you, Kat. Wow, what an introduction. <laughs> I only speak the truth. Um, so today is going to be, this is going to be a really fun show. Um, and it's also going to be, well, per usual, it's going to be very heart-centered. But uh, Linda has given us permission to um, talk about her experiences growing up as a gifted, sensitive, and uh, natural psychic. And she's had amazing experiences with shadow people with um, a guide showing up um, to guide her through dealing with the shadow people and her experience with her best friend that was a ghost from another era and as well as um, the past life memory that she had when she was as young as she can remember being six months old remembering it and we will get into all of that. And I just want to say thank you, Linda, for being vulnerable and open and sharing with us your journey, because I know uh, childhood can have a lot of tender moments. I'll admit it, uh, talk about our, our last one was triggers. This was a bit of a trigger for me because I think in some of these aspects, there might be three people that have ever heard these stories. Wow. And so, Lucia, we have an exclusive with Linda Coulter-Bird. 
seriously though like this is a anyway seriously this is linda coming out telling people what she has kind of hidden for a good majority of her life this I'm is speaking what looks about like. myself in a third person which is really odd something i never do well thank you for coming out of the psychic closet it will help other people do the same and our intention is that other people feel safe beginning to acknowledge and share their stories that um, made them weird or unusual as well. What is interesting for me looking back is that I had these very diametrically opposed thoughts about my childhood. One side, there was a part of me that says, doesn't everybody do this? Isn't this an experience that everyone has? And the other part that was being told I was weird to stop it. And I couldn't understand those two very different things still both being some, you know, true, if you want to say that, um, that it felt so natural to me. And as I grew up, I just, I didn't talk about it. I, but I still assumed that, well, doesn't everybody have weird things that happened to them in their childhood? like me, I did, and just maybe there's a lot of people who just don't talk about it. And that's part of why I want to do this is, is there probably are a lot of people who, if it's not in their childhood, it's later on in their life, that are experiencing things that they can't explain. Um, and hopefully this gives permission to open that dialogue. Absolutely. Let's hop into uh, your past life memory. Well, so we'll kind of start at the beginning when you were still not even a year old and your mother uh, being very concerned that you were going to suffocate yourself because you kept wrapping towels around your head and on the back of your head. What was that coming from? What was the memory that you were reliving? So as long as I can remember, and, and we have evidence, um, verified evidence of events that I could remember back to six months. Um, so when I say I can, I can remember early, I can remember lying in my crib. I can remember um, climbing out of my crib. I can remember <laughs> climbing up on a piano when I still couldn't walk. So I have very early, early memories. And one of those that would happen every night, and I considered a memory, not a dream, was my death. Your death. And, and it was um, as if there was a broken tape that just played nightly. It never varied. So, so part of my fascination is as we have memories, we remember our memories. And so they change over time, right? They, they alter because it's like a storytelling. This didn't change. It was like watching a film over and over again. And it was of me getting on a bus, a public bus, um, an older style bus. Um, having uh, brown hair, kind of looking like Marlo Thomasy. For those who don't know who she is, go look it up. That girl. Um, <laughs> yes, that girl. Um, but that kind of fifties hairdo, yeah. And um, and having a little girl with me, and getting her on the bus. And we always would sit in the same spot, catty corner from the it was like a routine caddy quarter from the driver he knew us we would sit in that same spot i would sit near the window she would sit at the edge and it was routine and who was I the little girl felt that uh, i'll get to that okay um so i never questioned in my dream who the little girl was she was just i knew i was the older woman and okay. as a baby i never questioned that that just was that was me um, there was no, there was no um, um, I'm trying to think of what the, the word is. Um, 
it, it just never, never occurred to me that that wasn't me. That wasn't it was you. Just ex yeah, it was me. Yeah, was I just accepted it fully and heartily that that, that older woman was me. Mm -hmm. And so we would get on the bus at, from the same corner. And at one point, I remember writing down in one of my journals the street signs. Like, it's important I should look at the street signs before, you know, because I remember glancing up at them. And I thought, well, there's one identifier as I got older. I'll write that down. As soon as I wrote it down, those street signs went out of my memory, which I found interesting. Um, and they simply were a fuzz after that. Like once I recognized it and documented it, they were gone. But I would get on the bus, sit there with my, turns out, daughter. Um, and a couple of stops later, it's, it's dusk, it's dark, getting dark. A guy gets on the bus and he sits in the seat behind me. And he seemed very out of sorts. He had brown curly hair. I could probably pick him out in a lineup today. Um, he had a flannel shirt, blue jeans, and was carrying a big like knapsack, like a government knapsack, kind of um, that type of green army bag. Um, and he had that with him. And he sat behind me and instantly I had an uneasy feeling and was on alert because he just didn't look right. And he, um, if I were to describe him, it would be like the Seattle grunge. Only back then, that would have been very inappropriate. Yeah, because the settings were, were like the 60s. It was like the late 60s. Yeah, like the early, late 50s, early 60s. Oh, yeah. 50s, early 60s, okay. Yeah, when I go back and I look at the clothing, the time period, you're looking at that, convergence of the 50s conservatism with the the hippie movement emerging uh, okay and so i felt very uncomfortable and i got a sense that he was um had come from something very traumatic like he was just not he was not all there mm -hmm. and he was sitting behind me and um i I just was not comfortable and he kept playing with my hair. To this day, if somebody does this with my hair and twirls, it is it will set me off. It is not something I like. It it is horrible. And so he would he was playing with my hair and I would lean forward and he'd continue. And so I real started realizing that um the stop we were supposed to get off on was a couple stops away and it was dark by now and there would be no one at that stop and it was a walk to our home and it wasn't going to be safe to stop there. But if we stopped and got off earlier, there was at least a store that would still be open. And I didn't know what we would do from that point, but that there would be people there and there was light there. Right, right. And so I wanted to get off early. So I'm quietly, trying to gather this child to get ready to get off early. And she's complaining that that's not our stop and I'm hushing her wow. and shh, you know, it's okay. It's okay. And, you know, just quietly get your things together and try not to create any indication with him. Although I know he's probably hearing her mm -hmm. that we're going to get off early. And so I sit back as if I'm completely relaxed trying to get her ready with him playing with my hair and he stops. And as I lean back, pretending to be calm, I feel this round, cold thing at the nape of my neck. And I freeze. And my thought is, what's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? And about the third, what's that? I realize it's the barrel of a gun. And instantaneously I hear a bang and what happens then is this heat this redness just absolute all I see is red redness and heat shoots to my head and down to my feet and then just as quickly blackness and coldness comes back up and then nothingness and then nothingness and that is my dream that I had every single night
It never varied. It never changed. And as a child, I didn't, I wasn't afraid of it. Like I, I didn't quite understand it. I knew that, that that was me, that I ended. And I didn't think too much about it. It was just like this loop, this broken loop that just kept playing. So you're saying as a child, you knew that you ended. I knew that I ended, but I was there. So there were all of those. It's like, okay, I know that's me. Mm -hmm. And I never questioned it. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, that was me. And, but what I did have was this fear of the back of my neck being exposed. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Cause as in the crib. Your yeah. Mom, yeah. Yeah. So my, my that. poor mom, I was told that the day she brought me home from the hospital, she laid me on the crib on my back and went into the other room for less, you know, she said a couple minutes. And she said she came back out and I was laying at the end of the bed with my, on my stomach, with my head through the railings. She never did understand how I got there. And um, so she said, you're the only newborn that I know that had to have bumpers in her crib, which are the little barriers so that I wouldn't choke myself. Mm -hmm. um, but every blanket she would put in, she said, as soon as I could get a hold of them, she said, somehow I would stuff them around the back of my neck and around my head. And as I got to where I could be more efficient at it, I would, it wouldn't matter that the entire rest of my body was not covered. What had to be covered was my neck up, my head, and all I would have was a little area for me to breathe through my nose. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way I felt safe. And I never really equated it to the dream I was having. It was just, I had to protect my head. Mm -hmm. And that was the only thing I could remember as a baby was that the back of my head was, had to be protected. And so it wasn't till my twenties and we'll possibly go through that at some other point where someone helped make sense of that for me, of that experience. But for me, um, having those memories of dying and still being here made death very strange for me as a child. Um, when my grandfather died, I remember everyone being so sad. And I remember not feeling sad for him. Mm. I felt sad from the family, from my father who lost his dad, mm -hmm. who wouldn't see him again but I never felt sadness for my grandfather who passed away. And it was, and I remember just watching everybody trying to figure out why everyone was so sad. And the only way I could um, make that um, make sense for me was because they were going to miss him. Mm -hmm. Cause you knew that we didn't really die that, that like you yeah. would just naturally that death wasn't really a thing. Right. Death so wasn't long. really a thing um, because I was here. Right. I was yeah. there and I was here. You were living proof that death was just a transition. Yeah. And so I didn't know the explanation behind it, but I knew that was me and I knew this was me mm -hmm. and that that was a very different person, but that was still me. And so it, it really was um, uh, it kind of messed with me as a kid, <laughs> not having a traditional sense of death. And it has, you know, it, it's, it's brought a lot of comfort as I've gotten older. Right. But it yeah. made you, it probably made you feel like you again were a misfit of some sort because you didn't have the reaction you you stood out you didn't have the same reaction or understanding like what the tribe was doing was not how you were connecting to the experience right and i know that children often don't understand death um and they're not that you know they don't get that whole concept but mine came from a completely different way because you did understand death but you didn't understand <laughs> it the way that the rest of the world understood it. Right, right. 
And so, um, yeah, that that happened. That dream happened every night as I was a child. As I grew older, it shifted to, you know, a few nights a week, then once a week. And then eventually in my 18 to 21 phase, it was about once a month. And at that point, my body started reacting to it. That's a whole nother story. Well, let's talk about that. And let's just bring us into that moment of um, you having kind of this more visceral experience because as a baby and as a young girl, it was a tape playing out. And then Mm -hmm. in your adulthood, it became something that you started to viscerally experience. Yeah. So we'll we'll end it on that story because we've got two Mm -hmm. other yeah exactly fascinating but that was for later (laughs) yeah and there's even like a part two to this part that i know about that we'll have to say for another time or maybe it'll be in linda's book Mm -hmm. um but that's even more like wackadoodle um and in her adult years um as she re-encounters this uh dream but tell us right now about your experience um laying in bed and viscerally going into that experience So as an adult, the way it showed up, the further apart those dreams became, they um, became more um, implanted into my body and visceral. And so when that red light flush happened. From the gunshot. From the gunshot and and the cold blackness that happened my body would would go beyond the freeze because I always wondered about, I don't know the term, but there's a term where you have paralysis from your dreams. Oh, sleep paralysis. And, oh, well, that would make sense. You had it, you had it. <laughs> um, but I've always been able to feel my heartbeat. I thought that was, again, something normal that everybody felt their heartbeat. Um, I've always been able to feel my heartbeat. And when that happened, the blackness took over, I would be paralyzed and I would realize my heart wasn't beating. And And I realized I wasn't breathing. And you're like 18, 20 or 18, 19. Yeah, yeah. And so at that point it would start happening where I, I would be conscious and I'd have to say, you know, I go through this whole thing, breathe, Linda, breathe, you can breathe. Okay, you can't breathe. Okay, can you open your eyes? Can you open? Okay, no, you can't open your eyes. Can you move a pinky? Let's try that. Can you move a pinky? If you can just get something in your body to move to tell you that this isn't real, to come out of this, that's all you've got to do. Move a pinky. Okay, that's not working. How about a toe? Usually the toe works. Move a toe. And something I would finally be able to get to move. And once I could get something to move and respond in my body, my poor husband would hear me sit up with a gasp of <gasps> and take that air in um, because then suddenly my heart would start beating again and I would breathe. Yeah. But it was my um, coming, I think it was because I was coming to the same age. I was approaching the age of the of me when I died, that it was actually starting to manifest more into my body. Oh my God. I just want to pop in for a second there because that makes total sense from my research with past life stuff. Cause I, you know, love all this information. I would, when people knew about a past life where, and then in this incarnation where they died or whatever that trauma was that afflicted them at that age, there would be something in their life at that age that would give them a similar wound. It wouldn't kill them this time, but a wound would show up from that same time frame yeah. and inflict, um, inflict upon their life, upon their body, upon their being, um, an echo or a mirror of that wound or incident that actually killed them before. So this is such a parallel to that. Thank you mm-hmm. for sharing that. Yeah. And, and in fact, to, to, to add to that, um, I wasn't much into woo-woo stuff. I wasn't, I was very practical and all of my growing ups and 
um, denied everything that happened to me that was anything other than logical, and there's an explanation for that that we'll cover. But at one point, I started to see energy workers, and every single one of them said that there was a hole at the nape of my neck that they couldn't close. What happened? And they tried, and they tried, and they tried, and they were not able to close that hole. And they said it was just this huge energy shooting out the back of my neck. Wow. And so that in a way was a confirmation for me that what I was experiencing and wanting to cover that, wanting to close that wound. As a baby, you were still- As a baby, I was still, it was very vulnerable. Right. And, and you, that's what yeah. I, and, and I've had neck problems most of my life. So there you go. There you go. All right. That is so juicy. And we literally could spend another hour, two hours um, going into this because there is so much more content. And yet here we are changing gears. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about Linda's ghost friends now as a child. Um, and I would like to hear your experience of your first encounter, like how old you were, I mean, you know, this is obviously this was a few years ago. So your memory of how old you were, your yeah. memory of your first encounter, whatever you can recall now. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's difficult for me because, um, time is very relative to me. Uh, it just doesn't, I, it drives my husband crazy, but I have always had an issue with time. Time just doesn't seem important. And so um, when I look back at my childhood, I kind of have to associate it with different events to try and place times on things. And um, when I was a child, we lived on 10 acres. And it was about as ideal a childhood as you could get, playing outside, feeling safe, um, having friends, and... Um, yes, it had its problems, but like every childhood, but I'd say, oh, and all, it was kind of Mayberry-ish mm -hmm. growing up. And um, on those 10 acres, we had a fenced-in area that was nice and soft grass, and then we had the pasture area. And I would ride my horse. We had ponies and a quarter horse, and I would ride them up and down this pasture area. And I remember one time, um, thinking that I saw somebody in some of the bushes, bushes slash trees, because, you know, they had little tiny um, sproutlings of trees. They, they weren't ever big trees. They were just small. I don't even know what kind of trees they were, but um, wispy little tree row of trees. And so I remember um, playing in that area and being very curious because I thought I saw something. And so my first real, I think that I remember encounter was I used to want to picnic. So I would take a blanket and take it out. And in fact, this is my blankie that I would take with me that I found recently. That's just probably why all of this is coming up that I would take out and lay out on the ground with me and eat my lunch. And one of those times, this little boy who was older than me, I was probably four, uh, it was before I went to school, so three and a half, four years old. Mm -hmm. um, I think he was my friend for about a year. Um, came out from behind the trees. And I remember thinking that's weird because I don't see him on the other side of the tree. But as he's coming from behind it, I see him on this side. Where's the rest of him? And as he steps from behind the tree. Did he look solid to you, transparent? He, he did. He looked solid to me as he came through. It's like he was stepping out from behind a curtain. You know, if, if, and... And he stepped over and he was very shy. And, um, and I remember just like having a conversation with him, you know, who are you? And um, as time went on, uh, he became one of my most trusted friends. And 
when I was frustrated. He didn't treat me like other kids. Mm -hmm. He didn't treat me like adults. He talked to me like a person. He didn't, he didn't talk down to me and we'd have conversations. And I remember often the conversations were me being upset or angry about something and him helping me work through it and very, you know, being very kind and, and me asking him questions. And he never talked a lot about who he was or his background. Um, but he, he was very distinct looking. He had um, a funny haircut. He had these glasses that I remember were really, really thick, like pop bottle thick and wire frames. Pop bottle, yeah. And yeah, just big old pop bottle thick glasses. And, um, and his shirt was different. He had a shirt that didn't have buttons, it had ties. And was it a lace off white tie around the collar with the it wasn't a it, there was nothing fancy there was nothing fancy he had a collar but like everything like the the sleeves there were no there were no buttons things tied and he had the closest that I can describe is knickers so for those that don't know knickers cut off at the above the knee and and again tied. Um, and they were, everything was tied, like there were buttons, which I thought was strange. And I was fascinated by his socks. And looking back, it's because his socks were handmade. Mm. They weren't socks you would buy. And that he had shoes that had funny buckles on them. I remember his shoes had very funny buckles on them. And that's what I remember about him. How old was he, would you guess? He was probably guessing, you know, maybe 10. He was older than me. Okay. But he was always, you know, he was probably 8 to 10. And he was, but he was always, he treated me, you know, not like a little kid. Can you hear his name in your head? Can you hear him say his name? Um, I have been trying to come back with his name, and I know it starts with an L. And I know it was a, um, like a Leonardo or a, it was, it was a foreign name. Mm -hmm. It wasn't Luigi. <laughs> it, it was <laughs> it's like, nope, wasn't that one. Um, but it was like a Leopold or a Leonardo. Okay. And again, somewhere in some diary, I have written it down. And again, as soon as I write something down, it slips. It's like, okay. You can let that go now. Interesting. And it's almost like pilgrim times is what it sounds. Yeah, like. almost like pilgrim times. Yeah. And um, one of our neighbors, whether they were full of BS or not, had said that that they had done research in the area and that there was a farm along that ridge where we were. They didn't know where it was on those ridges but that a little boy had died in a fire in the barn. Mm, okay. They didn't, and you know, I've never been able to find anything about it. Okay. Um, who I knows? Like he was much, much older. But to me, it feels like he was older, but that he was very associated with the land. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he would only show up in that one spot. If I wanted to see him, I had to come to him. Interesting. All right, and let's, um, for the sake of time, let's pop into um, what happened when you stopped seeing him, how that came sure. to be. So I, I told my mom about him. I was so excited when I saw him. I told her about him. And it was one of those, yeah, 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 yeah. And um, I here. very cute. Okay. And I remember being very frustrated because she would just, talk to him about, you know, she would say he was an invisible friend, you know, oh, what a cute invisible friend, Linda's got an invisible friend, you know, and it's like, no, I know what those are, he's different, like, I didn't know what he was, but I knew that's not what he was, I didn't have a word for him, and I wouldn't be very insistent, and that was about the time I was supposed to go to school, and I remember my mom telling me, you've got to stop talking about this stuff, or people are going to think you're weird, 
you know, don't talk about him, don't talk about this stuff, don't talk about that, you know, people will think you're weird. So stop it because you're going to school. And I was furious, you know, and I went and I complained to him, you know, how mom didn't understand. And I was so heartbroken when he said, no, actually she does. And you have to stop talking about me. And the only way you're going to do that is if we can't be friends anymore. And it broke my heart. I'm getting emotional. Yeah, I feel it. Um, and, you know, he said his goodbyes. And it was like losing my best friend. Yeah. Wow. You haven't really grieved that all the way through. Yeah. So you had to cut it off. He did. He, um, he cut off the relationship. <laughs> My first being dumped by a man. <laughs> but he, you know, he said, if I, he, your mom's right. If you, if you continue to talk about me and us and all of this, people will pick on you. Yeah. And so um, he said goodbye. And I went for months trying to get him to come back. And I remember my mom saying I didn't talk to her for weeks, months, I don't know. She says I didn't talk to her other than to yell at her that I made, he made, she made him go away. She made him go away. She made him go away and I was furious with her. I hated her for making him go away. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, that was a toughie. He was the only person that understood you. He was your yeah. own safe haven, really, in a world that didn't make a lot of sense to you. And it didn't. And it didn't help that I was kind of an ornery little shit. So um, <laughs> I was the holy terror of the three daughters. And yeah. Wrong personality. You can't. That's another, oh, that's just another part too. But I mean, you, you came in pissed off. I came in pissed <laughs> off. <laughs> Like that's, that's, that's another part. That is the other part of the story that you'll hear, but yes. That, that'll be another time, but you came in pissed off. Um, <laughs> all right. And so now we're going to have to shift gears again. Yes. Because of time. And this is yes. just a smorgasbord that we're offering up. Um, we are going to change gears once again. Er, er. And um, my gears are squeaky. Er. But um, we're going to talk to Miss Linda about her experiences with the shadow beings that she encountered. Mm. Again, yeah. at a very early age, like five, no, five. Yeah. Or so my recollection is it was after losing him as a friend. So I felt very alone. I had moved from a shared room with my sisters down into another room that had been wallpapered for me. It was all beautiful, you know, um, and it was my room and I was very proud of it. And I'd been in it for a while when I started seeing these very strange shadows coming from a corner of the house. And it was, you know, it was against the outer wall. The outer um, wall. Huh? The outer that? wall. Outer wall. Mm -hmm. So the corner that it was with was, you know, an inner wall and an outer wall. So the wall that had the cur the closet, closet doors, um, that corner. So there really wasn't anything to create the shadow. So I've always been incredibly analytical, even as a little kid. And, you know, I, we joke that my name's wa Linda with a Y because my first word was why, because I was always asking why. And so I you remember never seeing these. You have, never huh? you have never stopped asking why. I have never stopped asking why <laughs> or how, right. or how come, or how can we? <laughs> You're, you live in the question, which is a great place to live. It is, and um, can frustrate the Dickens GBs out of somebody that doesn't get it. <laughs> so, um, but I did these these things. These shadows would come, and and it was like at first they had no form, but over time, and it was over periods of weeks that these started 
forming into like shapes of people, only they were very angular. And, and the movement was somewhat angular. And I remember like looking and it's like, well, there is, is there a tree outside that's causing this shadow? Is there anything that can be causing these shadows? I remember thinking that distinctly and being very afraid when I realized, no, there's nothing that can cause these shadows. And how many did you of these shadow people were you seeing? So it started out after just a blob and as they started to separate and I would say half a dozen. Half a dozen, okay. And and they would move slowly, very slowly, each night going a little further across the wall. So were you up all night watching them? I would be up until I couldn't stay up anymore watching them, being afraid, hiding in my blanket and not knowing what to do. And um yeah it, and what i started to realize is that they you know they were heading towards the door that would go down the hall to my parents room or that they would go up or around the door and come back around and then they'd be getting towards me so and that was every night that they were inching a little bit further but it would take them hours 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 slowly Crop, it, traverse the landscape of your wall. Right. And it wasn't like it was the movement of the moon and the shadow from the moon. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I literally kind of paid attention to even those things, even at that age, trying to figure this out. Yeah. And there was nothing. And, and the fact that where there were natural shadows, they were darker than the shadows. They were blacker than the shadows in the room. They were blacker than the shadows in the room. And as I realized that they were getting closer to the door, panic set in. Like it went from fear to panic. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't know what to do. Like I didn't, I, and I'd already been told, don't talk about these things because people will think you're crazy. So what do you do when you can't go to your parent and tell them that there's these things that you see that obviously they've never seen? Um, and so I prayed. It's like I, I wasn't brought up in a religious home. Mm -hmm. I, um, I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know what to say if I was doing it right. I mean, all those things came in my head. It's like, I don't know what to do. And I don't know if this is going to be doing anything at all, but I got to try something. And I don't remember if it was the first time I prayed or if it took more than one attempt. But at one point, I remember switching from praying to God to praying to Jesus. And, um, and, and then I just prayed to anybody. Like, it was like, I'm so desperate. Just, is anybody out there that can help me, please? And so you don't know if this was all in one night or if this was a series of nights. You're not right, right. Them. I just remember going through those phases mm. of, like, pleading to anybody that can hear me. And How about Jesus, asking, anyone pick up, pick up? Please. Hello, is there anybody out there? Yeah. 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 Can anybody help me? Yeah. And... I remember that in the corner, you know, there in the farther corner, halfway in between, standing in the, the not corner, but in the room to the right of me, this light started to appear. And it was so brilliant. It was, and it started from this little tiny spot and just grew. And it was so bright. And it, as it got brighter, I looked and the shadow just quickly went back and went away so you saw as a light started to manifest the shadow that was crawling along the wall zipped back Just zipped back okay zipped back it's a ridge and point and left and gone yeah was was not even hiding in the corner like it was gone right. and this from this bright light then this more ethereal you could see through this um, being showed up and it was an old man 
And my first thought was, well, that, I'm, that doesn't match any of the pictures I've seen of Jesus or God. <laughs> <laughs> what did he look like? He, you know, if I were to describe him, he, the closest thing I ever saw was like Gandalf from the, you know, the Hobbit that he had a long beard and he had robes that were um, brownish, greenish in tone. Earth tones. Very earth tone. He had a staff. He had a wooden staff and at the top <laughs> of the staff was, no, he didn't have a hat. He had a cloak. Cloak, oh, a hood, a hood. A hood. Okay. And he had um, a, a crystal at the end of his staff. How big and was I realized, huh? He had a physical like upward tall staff. Longer, taller than him. Okay. Um, and, you know, I mean, it probably came to here on him. It wasn't taller than him, okay. but it was eye level. Um, and he was holding it. And I realized he was emanating light. And the staff was emanating light. The crystal on the top of the staff was emanating light. They were both emanating light. What color was the crystal, do you remember? It's the same color I go to when I'm, um, when I meditate or when it, it was a, I mean, the light itself, everything um, was just the brightest of white. Brightest. The crystal itself was an iridescent white light. Okay. So, um, but almost just pure, pure, pure white. Okay. For the most part, with just a little bit of the iridescence. Um, and it was, um, and so I asked him, you know, are you God? And he laughed and he's like, no. And well, are you Jesus? Yeah, no. <laughs> he laughed and, and I was like, well, who are you? And all I can remember is him describing himself as I'm a teacher, you know, and what word he used, that's what I remember. He was a teacher and he, and he said, I heard you, mm. you know, and I can help. And so he, he said, you always have the power within you to chase away darkness. You're born with it. And he said, I'm going to show you where it is. And he took the staff and about where this necklace is, which is why I wore this necklace, he took that staff and touched my chest. And deep within my chest, I felt and saw this little ember of light it was like smaller than an acorn. Burst open, bright. And he said, that is the fire within that you were born with, that you forget. Wow. He said, all you need to do to chase away fear is to blow on that light until it surrounds you and chases out the dark. And so I asked, you know, and, and I, I he said, just concentrate on making it bigger. Make the light so bright, there's no room for dark. And I kept, and I remember like buckling down, trying to make, and he said, no, 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 blow on it like an ember. And he literally had me and pretend to blow on the picture in my mind and blow with my lips that I was blowing on this ember to make it grow. And he said, now do that. And it will, you can, you can encompass your whole body. You can encompass this whole room. You can encompass this whole house, this whole town. You can encompass the world. Um, and you just need to let it grow. Foster, yeah, he didn't use the word foster, but make it grow. And it will chase out all the dark. And so I remember for days, and then he, and he left. 
uh, you know, he faded away just as he appeared and the light got darker, but the beans I noticed didn't come back. And, you know, over the days I started seeing them creeping again. And I, but I had already started practicing that, making it brighter. Blowing and up the ember. And making that ember. And at first it was very small. You know, it took a long time to get it to the size of a walnut. Wow. And you could see it in your mind's eye I as a child. I could see it in my mind's eye. And it was not at my heart. It was above my heart. I call it my second heart. Yeah. It's what's so high. the high heart area. High heart area. Yeah. I didn't know any of this. And so, um, but I remember at some point, once it hit the size of an acorn, that it expanded very, or a uh, walnut, it expanded very quickly. I was able to, like, then it became this bright light that I could push out. And I remembered, like, first I just cocooned myself. Mm -hmm. And that was like, well, what about my family? If they don't come after me, what about my family? So then I continued to push. And as I pushed in the room, they went back and were gone. And I was like, so then it was like pushed to my family. You know, I don't want them to go to my family. So I pushed further out. It's like, well, I don't want them to go to the neighborhood. So I pushed further out. And I just remember I kept pushing further out. And so that was a ritual I had through my, I don't know when I quit doing it, but at some point I did. But I know through the entire time that we lived there, I had that as a nightly ritual of pushing out this light. And this was in La Porte, Colorado, like. This is in Bellevue. Yeah. Bellevue, Bellevue, Colorado, which is a teeny tiny town. I'm it's, sure it was yeah. even smaller then. Yes, very, very teeny, not even a light, not even a, yeah. You know, um, and it's also a, a very big hot spot, I understand, um, from people. I've had experiences later on where um, that has come up in my life from people who have traveled as far as Africa to go to that spot. Wow. From Africa to Bellevue, Colorado. To Bellevue, Colorado. Wow. Um, and strange things for me happened in Bellevue, Colorado. And, and for someone that I later hired who lived not a mile from my home, there were things that we could feel there that were different. Like it felt like reality would stretch. And, and I remember talking to her and I said, do you ever remember hearing this weird sound? And she goes, yeah. And I go, wah, wah, wah. And she's like, oh, it used to scare me to death. And it was like, yeah, I used to get terrified when I would feel and hear that. You never knew what that was. And you didn't feel like it was related to the shadow people. It, was like it wasn't related to the shadow people. It was just, it was like reality was being pulled apart. If I were to describe it, it was just this stretching. Okay. And that sound we would feel and that physical sensation we would feel was stretching. And, um, you know, who knows? My parents, my dad saw UFO from our, our yard there. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people did. Um, it's a, I had more than one occurrence there. Um, we were told that it was a vortex there later on. Mm. So who knows, but that's what I grew up on. Wow. So you were not only just a psychic kid, you also grew up in, um, a psychic land <laughs> I don't call it landmine, but a, a psychic playground uh, where phenomenon was just, that was the norm. I think, I think much more than I, anyone was really aware of. Um, and it does have a very special feel to it. Um, and did you say that the other gal that you talked to, this person you hired had also encountered shadow people in her? Yes, she did. She encountered shadow people as well. She was the first one that I actually had heard the term shadow people from. Oh, so she said when, shadow people and you were like, yes, that's what they are. Yeah, I, yeah. Um, and so it was interesting to, to, that was probably the first validation that there's, oh, there's, that's a thing. Yeah, I remember thinking that's a thing. That's, that's other people see those things. Yeah. Yeah, I hadn't heard that phrase till about 
10 years ago or so was the first time yeah. I encountered it. Um, gosh. And yeah. And yeah. I also learned about it more from you. You were the only person I've ever heard of because I love the paranormal. I watch those shows. I read books, blah, blah, blah. But you were the first person I ever heard of ever that learned how to expel a shadow person, shadow people directly and had a skill and, and knowledge to do it. And the fact that you were, you know, five, six years old, when you were given that wisdom is just mind blowing that here you have been carrying this wisdom with you this whole entire time. And now we can gift it to the world. So if other people are encountering it, here's a technique which leads us to what we want to do next, which is Linda is going to guide us through a meditation on um, blowing on that ember so that everyone can have that. And I'll probably make it into its own little video so that way people can always go back to that and Linda can guide us through that process whenever you want to practice it. And whether you're encountering shadow people or not, this practice of blowing on your high heart, that ember above your heart chakra, I feel like is something that is a skill that is being gifted to us at this time via Linda's experience, because you can use it for expelling your own fear about anything. You can use it to protect your house from anything, your, your community, et cetera. And if we were all practicing this together, if we were all practicing blowing on this beautiful ember together in a space and we just magnified it out into the world, what kind of, beauty would that usher in yeah. what kind of experience would that unfold for us so yeah. i'm excited that linda's willing to do that with us today thank you and it really does feel like it's coming out because of this and one of the things that um so i i auditorially get hits i call them my and, Our audience yeah and one of the things that uh, just came through was don't forget it was about love it's about love about love it's funny as you were, because I was getting this tone in my ear right before as well. So we were both getting hits. So. Yeah, yeah. That that the thing I didn't say was that light was not a judging light. That light was pure radiant love. Oh, beautiful. And so as you as you practice this, keep that in mind that what you're practicing and blowing on are embers that we are born with oh, yeah. of love, of and divine love. It is the divine might within us. Embers of divine love that we are born with and we're simply sparking that ember that already exists mm -hmm. and like allowing it to expand yeah. and grow. And so we're gonna experience our own healing of some kind as we do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So for Everyone that is tuning in at this point, this is a meditation that will be spontaneous and will um, help to tap into that light that is within us all. And I ask that you become quiet and still. Breathe naturally. You feel the need to take a deep breath. Wonderful. Breathe in and out. With each breath, let yourself sink deeply into your chair. If you're lying down on the floor, almost to the point where you can feel yourself moving past that surface. Go deeper. Allow your feet to reach out to the earth below, below whatever foundation is below your feet, down deep. Let the energy of your being drop into a grounded state of being. 
Allow the earth energy to rise up as you reach down. Making that connection stronger. Picturing yourself going deeper and deeper, allowing anything that is not in your highest good to flow down. The earth knows how to recycle it how to create good with it, being gratitude as you release and allow that to happen with love. Being re-energized by the energy from the earth, moving up your body. at its own pace, filling in the voids created by what you've released. If there's any area within you that needs attention, needs love, needs healing, allow that energy to focus in those areas as it moves through. To the tips of your fingers, top of your head, swirling and filling every organ, cleansing and releasing anything that is not in your highest good. As you reach the top of your head, let that open. Picture a lotus flower, picture a crown. Allow that to open and allow who you are to reach higher for who you are moves far beyond this body. Let it reach all the way to your source, that which you hold holy, whatever name you give it, for it is beyond names. As you reach there, allow yourself to open even further. Allowing the flow from above now to come down through you like a rain, a soft, misty, thick rain of light, of dew, pouring down, bringing healing and softness, knowledge and love to you. flow through you all the way down into the earth, bringing healing to our planet as well. Observing yourself as a conduit from above and below 
there is a spot within you that rests the spark of your divine self. Look inside. It's above your heart. Can you see it? It may be dark, maybe sleeping, but it's there. It may already be light and vibrant. That spark is your divine being, your connection to all, to source. It is the spark of your true self. size is it? How bright is it? Dear ones, it is always there. Even when you can't find it, it is always there. You cannot detach from it. You simply need to acknowledge and allow the spark to start again. And once it has started, you just need to feed it. Blow on it like an ember in your mind's eye. If it's hard for you in your mind's eye, use your lips and blow. Blow air, blow love, and imagine it going to that divine spark because what you're doing is acknowledging your presence, your true presence. And your true presence is divine love. As you blow on that ember, feel the warmth, feel the light, feel the expansion within. Can you feel it? Can you feel the excitement? Excitement comes from the acknowledgement of who you are. Allow that to grow, for it is not just for you, but for everyone. For now is the time for us, all of us, to acknowledge our divine selves, the spark that was placed within us, that was always us. The collective of this light can burn away all darkness. Darkness is only an illusion. It is only an acknowledgement of the absence of the light. This is a tool, a tool that can be used when facing fear. It's important to remember that the tool is the love, the love that is within you, that is you, that is us. From that divine 
love and being we all of us can shift this world without judgment with love and acceptance and acknowledgement that we are all divine even those that don't appear divine have their role it is not for us to judge their role allow discernment in your life which is very different than judgment. The light is the absence of the judgment. It is how we see you. Can you feel it? We feel it. Dear ones, expand that love, that light, as far as you can. Let it grow without effort through gentle acknowledgement. Blow on it. Feed it love. Feed yourself love. By doing so, you will feed others. What a beautiful place this planet can be as we move forward in light. You may carry this light with you always, for it has always been with you. When you are frightened, reach in expand out. As we greet one another, we can greet in the light. What a wonderful way that would be to greet. doesn't even have to happen at a conscious level, but you'll know, you will know, you will recognize, and you will smile. This is the dawn of a shifting that is taking place, an awakening of sorts. Allow the white light to guide the way. Take one more deep breath. Expand your light a little further. And rejoice. Walk in beauty and joy. This is the beginning. And so it is. So it is. Thank you, Goddess. Thank you for blessing us with that meditation that transcends time and space. I know that as people do this meditation, we can send healing through dimensions, through time, through space. It transcends because you channeled that from your guides, from your higher self. So I just want to say thank you so much for gifting us 
with that journey of divine healing and divine light. Thank you. I'll be curious to watch it because I'm not quite sure what I said. <laughs> that doesn't, I was like, oh, she's channeling. She's channeling. Here it is. Um, that was beautiful. And again, for our audience, I will make this into a separate meditation that um, you can just click on and listen to. I'll put some music or sounds with that that will help that mental, emotional, spiritual deepening um, of that journey. Thank you, everyone. Thank you yeah. for allowing me to have that gift of, mm. of reigniting the light within me. I don't know what to say. It's, it's such a blessing. Um, I feel very emotional. Yeah. This, this was a gift that your people have, are excited and happy to finally be able to share with the planet because you are ready as a vessel to give it. And so this is an opening on so many levels. Um, I feel honored to be part of it. Out of curiosity, does your chest feel about 10 times bigger than... <laughs> I feel like it's expanded. Yeah, I feel a, a new resonance, I'll say. And I'm going to do this meditation um, on my own later today. Um, so, yeah, I had my own little journey with that. And mm -hmm. I'll be curious to hear for people to comment what their experience was and for yeah. them to leave their feedback about what their experience was. I really would be curious. And how many have felt that light before? How many of us already were aware of that? I would love to know. Yeah. All right. Well, we are absolutely over time. Absolutely. <laughs> um, are there any closing thoughts, uh, feelings, insights, wisdoms that, wisdoms that you would like to share, Miss Linda? I just am grateful to anyone who is participating with us in this growing I don't know even know what to call it community mm -hmm. and light family I'm very excited to begin with our guests and begin having more dialogue with everyone mm -hmm. i'm i'm just over the moon with joy so thank you yeah and next week, we will be introducing um, another goddess, Karen Swain, who is a psychic and um, healer and teacher of conscious creation, of deliberate creation. And she hails from um, Australia. And she's somebody who's been pivotal in my journey, her wisdom, her guests, her teachings. So we're excited to bring her in and uh, share a space with the, our audience with her as well. Very excited. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be amazing. All right, let's wrap it up there. Thank you, everybody. I value you, appreciate you, and I'm excited to connect with you even more. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.